Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today's reading is from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 5. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. That's the end of the reading. Thanks, Katrina. Morning, everyone. Good morning. It is um, my privilege to wrap up our Genesis 1 to 12 sermon series this morning. And I hope you've enjoyed, you know, studying the first section of the book of Genesis, you know, where we've covered some very classic Bible stories over the past eight weeks. Uh, just a very quick recap on where we've been so far, okay? So we started in Genesis 1, in the beginning, where God created the heavens and the earth. The creation account where in six days God created the world and everything in it by his command. You know, the light and the darkness, the sky, the land, the seas, and the plant life, the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the living creatures in the sea and on land, and of course, human beings. And creation was very good at this point, with humankind living under God as his image bearers, ruling over and taking care of the earth. Now, the first humans, Adam and Eve, were living in perfect relationship with one another, perfect relationship with creation, and in perfect relationship with God, how it was meant to be. However, in Genesis 3, we have a massive plot twist, a turn of events which sees a very good creation sadly become very bad. After being tempted by the devil, Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They seized autonomy and they chose to define good and evil for themselves, something that they as created beings are incapable of doing. And the result of their sin, the once perfect creation, is now imperfect. Each living thing now destined to eventually die, relationships between human beings are now tainted with struggle for control and a lack of trust. More importantly, the relationship between God and humanity was also fractured. Sin has created this barrier of doubt and conflict where there was once complete trust and peace. From Genesis 3 onwards, we see the curse of sin just wreaking havoc, devouring humanity, taking no prisoners, causing brother to murder brother. The story of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. Then in Genesis 6, all the people on the earth are becoming increasingly evil. So evil that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil all the time. The condition of humanity deeply grieves God. And he orchestrates a massive reset. And he rightly judges their evil in the form of a huge worldwide flood. But in an act of grace... Undeserved favor, God gives Noah, saves Noah and his family, and they take refuge on an ark full of animals, and he gives them the responsibility of repopulating the earth as the flood waters subsided. Noah worships God. God makes a covenant, a binding promise to humanity and all living things that he will never, ever flood the whole earth again. And what does he seal the promise with? A rainbow, a beautiful rainbow in the sky. You know, and I often walk my daughters to school during the week, and on quite a few days this year, because it's been rather wet, we've seen some magnificent rainbows in the sky, haven't we? You know, I was reminded by one of my daughters as we were walking, she looks at the rainbow and goes, oh, I love rainbows, because they remind me of God's promises. And that's a beautiful thing. And although God gives this beautiful promise to Noah and to all living things, it doesn't take long for the humans to mess things up again. Noah gets so drunk that he passes out naked in his tent. Humans who were given the command to multiply and to fill the earth were instead content to stay huddled in one place where they gathered 
and they admired how smart and how great they were becoming. They celebrate their greatness, they decide to build a city, the giant tower reaching up to the heavens to make a name for themselves. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. And God, not a huge fan of arrogance and pride, he humbles them by confusing their language. You know, remember that's where we get the English word Babel from. So we got Babel from Babel. And God scatters humankind over the face of the earth. And from the children of Noah, generations come and go. Then in Genesis 12, we find ourselves in the story of Abram, a man that God, by his grace, has chosen to bless, and also to bless all the families of the earth through him. We looked a little bit at this covenant that God made with Abram last Sunday, but today we're going to wrap up the series. We're going to look a little closer at the promises and how God never fails to keep his promises. In the covenant made with Abram in Genesis 12, there are three main promises that God makes to Abram. So first one is land. God promises to give Abram a land to live in. Second promise, descendants. God promises to make Abram and his descendants into a great nation. And number three, number three blessing. God promises not only to bless Abram, but to bless the families of the entire earth through him. So land, descendants, and blessing, okay? As we briefly look at these three promises and how we see them unfold throughout the Bible, we're also going to look at how these promises are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And by the end of the sermon, I'd like each of us to ask ourselves this personal question. Do you trust God to keep his promises? Or I will get into the text. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And it's not long we see this promise of land fulfilled just four verses away, actually. So God says, go. Abraham, sa Abraham says, okay. <laughs> Has anyone ever moved house? Okay. Is it easy? It's really not easy, is it? Okay. So when we move, we usually get to weigh out our options. You know, we get to have an idea of where we're going, right? Abram had no idea. Okay. But in obedience to God, he leaves everything behind, his own country, his father's household, and all the things that he is used to. And in faith, he sets out for the land of Canaan, and he arrives there. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abram, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his name in the promise, home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So Abram obeys God by faith, and God proves himself faithful in his promises. He brings Abram to the land he promised him, to the promised land of Canaan. And although God's people, in their struggles with sin, they see themselves drifting in and out of this promised land throughout the Bible, this promised land was a picture that points to a future and eternal home for God's people. You know, a heavenly home. A home that's reserved for those who have their faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ. And this brings us to the next promise of descendants. And God's promise of descendants to Abram starts to unfold in Genesis 17, when God changes Abram's name to Abraham, which means father of many nations. And in Genesis 21, God, faithful to his promise, gives Abraham and his wife Sarah their first child, Isaac. When Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, I'd say this was a pretty miraculous event. God doing the impossible. And the family line of Abraham grows and grows, and after a few generations, we see this in Exodus 1. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Okay, so God once again, faithful in keeping his promise. Abraham's offspring becomes the great nation of Israel. Romans 4 says this, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. 
And the New Testament expands this concept of Abraham's descendants to not only include, include his physical descendants, but also those who share Abraham's faith in God. This includes both Jews and Gentiles who come to faith in Jesus Christ, making Abraham the father of all believers. Galatians 3. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. This leads us to our third promise of blessing. In Genesis 24, near the end of Abraham's life, we read this. Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. So toward the end of his life, we see that he, Abraham was wealthy, he was respected, he had a growing line of descendants, and even in his own struggles and failures, which there were many of, you can read about them, God was always with him, always faithful to his promises. And the blessings Abraham received from God were far more than just personal blessings. You see, all nations would be blessed through him. And through his offspring, particularly in leaders like Moses, like David and Solomon. But this promise was ultimately fulfilled through none other than Jesus Christ. A descendant of Abraham's whose life, death, and resurrection brought salvation into our world. Galatians 3, once again, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. You see, Jesus Christ's death on the cross brings the blessing of salvation to all people, not just the descendants of Abraham, but to all who have faith in Jesus Christ. God saw that humankind could not save themselves. You know, even God's chosen prophets and kings, including Abraham, they failed greatly you know, in their lives, and humanity really needed a savior to put them back into right relationship with God. God, in his amazing grace, sends his only son, Jesus, to earth. You know, Jesus, fully God, fully human, came into, with us, into the earth and was tempted in every way that we are, but he never, ever sinned. And even though he lived a perfect life of obedience to God, he willingly gives up his life on the cross for us. He died the death that we deserved and paid the penalty for all of our sins, but he didn't stay dead. Death could not hold Jesus down. Jesus, in his mighty power, was raised from the dead, defeating the curse of sin and death for us. And the risen Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And whoever turns away from their sins and turns towards faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior will receive the blessing of his Holy Spirit, who enables us to live in obedience to God in this earthly life. And when Jesus returns to judge evil and restore all things to himself, all who repent from sin and believe in Jesus will also receive the blessing of eternal life in the new heaven and the new earth, living with God and his people forever. The Apostle Peter says this in Acts, And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. You see, Peter connects Jesus to the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, showing us that the ultimate blessing is spiritual. It involves repentance and reconciliation with God. So in closing, we see in Genesis 1 to 3 that God promised Abraham land descendants, and blessing. And as we've seen how, we've seen this now, the promise of land points to a future eternal home in God's presence. The promise of descendants includes all those who share Abraham's faith in God, both Jew and Gentile. And the promise of blessing through Abraham ultimately comes to us in the salvation offered through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, in Christ, we see the fullness of all of God's promises. And just as Abraham trusted in God, even when things seemed impossible, we are called to put our faith in the one who fulfilled all the promises. So as we close our series in Genesis, let us consider this question. Do you trust God to keep his promises? 
you know, in whatever season of life you find yourself in today. You know, maybe life is good. Maybe life's not so good. Maybe life is really easy for you right now. Or maybe it's really hard. But friends, I want to encourage you, whatever season that you find yourself in, through Jesus Christ, we can have confidence that God is always faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just as he kept his promises to Abraham, he keeps his promises to us. Let me close with some words that the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken to us by the glo- to the glory of God. All the promises, yes in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen to that? Amen and glory to God.